All right, good morning, everybody. We will get started now. I'm Gabriel Metcalf, CEO of the Committee for Sydney, and you are joining for today's edition of Committee for Sydney Live. Um, today, we're going to hear from Jeremy Thorpe, who is the chief economist of PwC, um, for what, what I think is going to be a really interesting discussion. We follow PwC's work closely at the committee. Um, the managing partner of uh, PwC's Sydney office, Sue Horlin, is on our executive board, and um, they are for us an important source of insights. What prompted uh, what prompted us to ask Jeremy to join us today is a really interesting report he put out called Australia Rebooted, The Nine Forces of Change That Will Shape Australia. Um, it is not really a prescriptive report in the sense of telling government what to do exactly to speed up the recovery. Um, so it's, it's different from things you would have seen coming out of the committee, like our 11-point recovery plan we put out last week. Um, but this is the kind of thing we draw on as we develop our policy proposals. So for us, it's a, it's a really um, nice chance to get to um, hear from one of the people doing the underlying big picture economic thinking. Um, and this report really identifies um, trade-offs and choices and potential scenarios that I think we all need to think through as we're thinking about recovery. Um, so the way this works uh, is he'll make his remarks um, and then you all can submit questions via the Q&A app on Zoom and I will sort through those and we'll go from there. So Jeremy, thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule and I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate everyone being on the call. Um, and please do hammer away at the questions. Uh, be argumentative. I think that's uh, going to be a, a much better outcome if we can achieve that. Um, I'm going to share my screen and share some slides. Um, thank you. Yes, this is built off uh, work we've done called Australia Rebooted. Um, but underlying that, we've also got subsequent, as you mentioned, it's not a prescriptive paper. Um, and it doesn't come at it from a particular sectoral perspective, but we're now publishing deeper dives on industries from um, both from a thematic perspective and a sectoral perspective. But today I want to talk to you more about the broader paper, but I'll give you a, a, a city lens into it because I think it lends itself very well to that as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the initial recovery, but I don't want to talk about it much, um, but I'm happy to take more questions on it. But this is what we're kind of talking about very much at the moment, what's happening in the economy. Um, and we've had effectively the alphabet of options that have been discussed. Um, the, the V, the U, the L, there was even a discussion of a W-shaped recovery. In other words, we have a second bout of the virus and we shut down the economy again. It's interesting how far we've come in such a short time. If I went back, and I think it's five or six weeks, I lose track in Corona time. Um, the Commonwealth Bank published its, its view of the world, and it said that there was a 65% chance of a U-shaped recovery. Um, but we shut down the virus to such an, a degree. There's now a consensus we've moved towards being a V-shaped recovery. And it gets talked about in the press in that way. Politicians like to talk about it. And it's certainly true that the recovery from a health pandemic is different to a recession which is driven from a financial perspective. Um, if effectively, we have purposefully shut down the economy um, and it will unwind either because we have managed the virus or we've actually found a cure. Now, we're not going to find a cure anytime soon, if at all, but it looks like we've got the health system up, we've flattened the curve, um, and we've got it at a manageable level. Even if we see further outbreaks, um, it doesn't mean that the economy as a whole needs to shut down or segments of the economy need to shut down in the same way. So there will be a bounce back. And so the V is the language that most people use. But I kind of want to caution the simplicity of using a, a V as a descriptor for what we think is going to happen. 
Um, and that's because I prefer that we thought about this as what I'm calling the kink to V. Um, and if you look at the Reserve Bank's forecast that it's published lately, you see a V with a slight kink in it. Um, it might even, I suggest, be a bigger kink. And I just want to give you that flavour because um, I'm an economist and I don't want you to be too optimistic. Um, that's a default answer. Um, effectively, we come down the V shape and we're hopefully we're at the bottom of the V at the moment. Um, and we're about to unwind, we're starting to unwind the economy and uh, allow activities to reoccur. We will see, we expect to see a sharp rebound in economic activity. Um, but it will temper and taper and the growth will taper off. And I want to explain why that is, because it's important if you're thinking about what's happening in the economy and you're planning. Um, what we know is that in most recessions, unemployment peaks about 12 to 18 months after the bottom of the, the, bottom of the recession. Um, equally, we know that business failures kind of peak at that point as well. And in fact, we'll expect to see even more of that here. The government has, the federal government has explicitly through JobKeeper sought to uh, enable businesses to get through this time, through this environment, so that they can emerge at the other side and be a viable business and turn the lights back on, bring the staff back in and reboot the economy. Um, but what we know is that we're going to see an initial flush of activity. People, when they're released from their social, social isolation constraints, will go out to restaurants, will get their hair cuts, will get that massage, will go to the video, uh, go to the movies. Um, there will be a, a, an, an outpouring of doing things that I was not allowed to do. That doesn't necessarily mean a sustainable level of demand. Um, particularly when businesses come back and find that they've got occupancy restrictions or that there's depressed demand because people are more nervous, and I'll explain about that in one of our forces, um, or they've just got lower capacity to pay because they're, they're, they're a greater number of unemployed. So we will see demand flatten. And so I want to give you that sense of um, be excited for the next couple of months, but particularly the challenges we unwind, JobKeeper and JobSeeker, we will see that flattening out. Our modelling suggests, and in fact, it's pretty similar now, I see, to the uh, Reserve Banks, it'll take about two years to get back to where we were in January this year from a GDP pers perspective. So we've got two years of disruption in, in the economy. Um, and that's the challenge that we're going through at the moment. Um, and what I want to talk today is not so much about that challenge, but I'm happy to do it in questions if you want to do it, because I think we're really still in the shock and the management phase of this, this, this um, uh, post-economic environment, or post-COVID environment. Um, and we're doing everything, obviously, that we can as, as um, government, as businesses, to, and as health officials to both manage the virus and provide a degree of stability. Um, I, the analogy we use is we're in a triage environment. We've had, a, we've had a major shock. Um, we're we're tr just trying to stabilise the economy at the moment. The question we've got is, what do we look like after, that, after we've stabilised? How do we want to grow the economy? Well, how will the economy grow? Um, but how do we want to shape that growth in that post-COVID environment? We're suggesting really that's after the next couple of years. So let's get back to where we were in January, um, fix what we need to fix, encourage businesses to be able to continue to operate, to um, restart, to re-employ people. But we think there's a series of forces that are going to change um, what that economic recovery looks like beyond that two years. So over the next decade, what is Australia going to be shaped by? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, and so we've grouped the forces of change into three different groups. The first group is around people. Um, and some of this might sound really, uh, in some ways, simplistic, and I'm not meaning to be simplistic. Um, but a lot of these forces, it is not as though they are new things, but they're often accelerated trends that we may have otherwise seen. Equally, you don't need to see massive shifts in some of these forces to see important structural change in the economy. Even slight shifts of behaviour, slight shifts of incentive, um, may be enough to disrupt existing business models, to uh, disrupt existing planning, to force people to actually 
go back and rethink what, you, what they're doing, particularly in industries with low margins, particularly from government perspectives. Um, so I want to flag it now that it's not any individual change that we need to see a lot of significant shift, but it's the package of changes together are going to lead to different outcomes. So I'm going to walk you through the nine and then kind of give you a, a summary at the back end of how we think that fits together and what the priority, even not being prescriptive, but directionality, um, we need to think about to maximise our opportunities. Um, the first one here is about productive, flexible and distributed working. Uh, I'm at home. I'm assuming that most people on this call are, are at home or somewhere else other than a traditional workplace. Um, we are going to see we've seen remarkable flexibility. Um, we're all acquired skills. We've all learned the phrase, your, your microphone is on mute, uh, the phrase of 2020. Um, and what we're seeing is that shift to being able to work, you know, remote, digitally enabled way. It's a different set of skills that underlie the enablement of that, much more digital enablement. Um, we're not all going to work from home forever, um, but interestingly, just to give you an example, we did a staff survey and only 13% of our staff said they want to come back to our offices five days a week after we come back. Um, now, that's not to say everyone wants to work at home five days either. There's a, there's a blend in there, but we've had flexible, all roles flex in encouraging people to work from home and it's not been easy. So that interestingly that 13% say, only 13% say they want to be back in the office all the time, is a real acceleration of that trend. That's going to have implications across cities in all kinds of ways. Even small shifts are going to have implications. Uh, whether you're in the office tenancy space, um, commercial space in CBDs, clearly there's benefits of agglomeration. They haven't existed, they've disappeared overnight. But it's probably going to take a little bit, temper that at, at the margins at least. That then has implications for issues such as public transport, um, capacity, I'm sorry, my dog is barking at a bird. I hope that's not too loud. Um, it's gonna have issues for distributed living. So people, if they're working from home, are less likely, are less likely to travel far. They're likely to um, buy local. We've certainly seen a trend around that of if you're at home, um, your local shops become a different type of environment for you, greater reliance on it. It starts to also have challenges around cities themselves, around um, the issue of can people live and work more remotely? As a city, we've had a challenge, obviously, with net migration out because of the cost of living. I've got a team member that works remotely out of Newcastle for the last uh, nine or so months. Um, we're seeing that already. Is this going to accelerate that demand for uh, moving out of the cities or to seek a different lifestyle? State governments are all doing business cases around um, faster rail connections to regional communities. Does that have a new emphasis now? Um, the second trend here is around consumption behaviour. When we started thinking about this, we were very conscious of the, the idea of having more cautious consumers come out of this. And that was really from two perspectives. And one though I think has been downplayed, or we're downplaying a little bit now as we've moved on. And that was the health perspective. Um, if the health pandemic had been felt more acutely in Australia, we certainly had the view that consumers may be more risk averse just from a, a health perspective. I've got a feeling that's not going to be as significant given that we've managed to control the pandemic in a way that um, you know, three or four months ago seemed uh, remarkably um, uh, unachievable, but we have achieved it and flattened the curve. Um, but we know coming out of recessions, we end up with more cautious consumers. Um, savings rates go up. Uh, you, the banks are awash with cash at the moment where people have um, started saving more or moved money out of um, other, other sources into bank savings. Um, the savings rate has gone up as a result. We know coming out of recessions there tends to be a reduction in discretionary expenditure, particularly larger discretionary items. Again, history isn't always the best judge coming out of this pandemic because it is, it is a different type of recession. So we've actually seen a lot of purchasing of things that traditionally we would have said were discretionary um, and large. So gym equipment, for example, a lot of stocking up on home um, furniture. Uh, we'd normally see those as having a significant downturn coming into and out of a recession. But the nature of this recession where people have been at home meant people have been stocking up and fixing their home and they've been building their nest. 
but that itself is a sign of caution. So it will be interesting as, for example, when gyms go back, um, do people want to go back to that environment? So consumption behaviour is going to change. Um, and we think they're going to be, consumers are going to be more cautious. That has implications if you're in the retail segment. Um, it also has implications, again, if people do build the nests. Um, do we see people wanting larger properties um, to facilitate that? So our, what we purchase and how we purchase in that environment is going to be potentially kind of different. The sleeper issue with people, um, and it's probably not a sleeper issue for many businesses, is the issue of migration. Um, we're looking at 85% reduction in migration next year in Australia. Um, now, government's flagged it wants to get back to traditional levels, um, but we're already seeing a debate around, in a period of higher unemployment, do we want um, to have more people coming in? Now, many of our migration statistics are actually including foreign students, so we want them, um, no doubt. The issue, though, is we've had a large pool of both skilled and semi-skilled and often seasonal workers coming in supporting Australian businesses. Um, half our GDP growth over the last couple of years has actually been driven by population growth. So if we're not going to receive that population growth, that itself is going to be another dampener on economic activity going forward. How we come out of this and think about um, migration is going to therefore be a really cha a challenging issue for us. It's going to be felt by the housing construction industry, for example. Um, we're going to see it in, a, in any industry that relies on population growth for some element of its um, uh, sales growth. So for, let me give you an example. Phones, um, we all replace our phones every now and then, but there's a degree to which the phone industry relies on new people coming in and population growth, just making the market larger to underpin that growth. If we don't have that, there's a whole segment, whole range of segments that are going to be uh, feeling more challenged. The next batch is around um, the economy itself. Um, clearly, in this environment, we've seen um, agility. We've seen agility by consumers, as we're doing now, who are doing things digitally, who um, may have done it in person before. We've seen businesses that either didn't have uh, either sales or um, delivery capacity of online now actually doing that. Um, we've seen, again, I think an acceleration, not nothing new in many senses, but it is that acceleration. Again, patterns will readjust as we emerge back out into the um, a, our new normal. But you don't need to see significant shifts in consumer behaviour or business behaviour here. Um, to actually be meaningful shifts that are going to shake up industries or businesses themselves. Um, again, we're not going to go back to where we were. It feels like technology and those skills that we're going to need for that are going to underpin um, a greater degree of our economic activity. Industry consolidation, I'd suggest we haven't seen this one truly yet, but we know that recessions generate business failures. I mean, it's unfortunate, but it's reality. We've seen remarkably few business failures to date. Um, obviously, Virgin's the most high profile. Um, we saw a lot of failures come over the last year, particularly in the retail space, where competition, price pressure, digital competitors and so forth. Um, and I suspect we'll see more of that coming out of this. But the Australian government has particularly sought to make sure that businesses don't fail. Um, but as I said, as we unwind JobKeeper, there's a greater chance, and hist history says it's 12 to 18 months, as we get to the kinked bit of the V, that we are going to see more businesses fail. Um, interestingly, the Australian government put constraints on foreign investment um, when the dollar was particularly low, didn't want to sell the farm for cheap, was the kind of narrative, um, but has continued to put on some foreign investment constraints. So we might see industry consolidation. It may be the government will not allow the same degree of overseas dominance coming through in, um, in that process. So quite a conservative, um, quite a conservative uh, Australia first view around how industry consolidation might actually occur. The other interesting bit is obviously Virgin has been very topical. Um, interestingly, the government 
allowed the industry consolidation in that space to play out rather than stepping in to be government managed in a sense. So it's, and you can see the philosophy there. On one hand, government is intervening to shape industry consolidation or restrict it from a foreign investment perspective, but from a domestic perspective is allowing, allowing the consolidation to play out however it plays out. Um, the other point about industry consolidation is businesses themselves are choosing to consolidate. So not from an acquisition or failure perspective, but we're seeing bank branches that have closed temporarily. I suspect some will not reopen. We've seen Australia Post change its delivery model to have less frequent postal delivery, um, things that have been talked about publicly for some time. So the, the, the environment that we're in has allowed consolidation of certain business operating models themselves as well. Resilient, secure supply chains. If uh, I suspect every board and every senior management team has had a been asked questions or is looking at themselves around, uh, has this environment where we've shut down international borders for people particularly, but from a goods perspective also exposed additional risks, um, either because we've got single country failure risk or we've got um, uh, just risk from overseas in, in the current environment that has meant supply chains may have been disrupted. Um, again, you don't need to see significant disruption. You only need a single component to mess things up here. Um, I'm not suggesting that the world is going to, we're going to abandon global supply chains, but I think boards are at least asking what's the risks that we've got? Have we managed those risks? Have we diversified them appropriately? I suspect some activities will be brought home just to manage that risk. Government, I suspect, will equally put some pressure in, say, the PPE and the health space to make sure that we have a domestic capacity to manage that risk going forward. Um, while we think about it from an Australian perspective, we also potentially lose us from other countries doing this same exercise. Um, uh, we've seen Donald Trump muse and he muses about a lot of things, but he's been musing about the Joint Strike Fighter, global supply chain, um, Australia, Turkey, uh, Japan and many other countries. Uh, in Western Sydney, we, we build components and I think we do some servicing for the Joint Strike Fighter. He's asking why, from a US perspective, have they got that global supply chain risk? So just as we think about maybe this means a consolidation back to Australia, it possibly means a consolidation, at least in a threat sense, back to other countries as well. So we're going to have some real challenges here. Um, the, the third group out of the nine um, is around government and the social contract, really. Um, the, the next force that we've seen is out of every recession, we see greater government involvement. It does vary, though, from each recession as to what that involvement looks like. And so the challenge here is trying to think what do we think is going to emerge from a government role here. I would have traditionally said the thing that um, we see out of every recession is higher government expenditure at the end of it. In other words, um, there's, we spend during the recession to try and mitigate the, uh, the social costs. We come out of the recession and we have a higher level of government expenditure than we had going into the recession. Um, the current, government stri current federal government striving not to do that. Um, it was very vocal in its criticism of the Rudd Labor government um, and the, how it handled the GFC from embedding higher expenses. It pointed to, you know, primary schools were still building covered learning areas or COLAs five years after the recession and still under that package of uh, stimulus. Um, so it did not want to be locked in and therefore it's built in many safeguards or triggers. So we see September as the deadline for shutting down JobKeeper and JobSeeker. Doesn't mean we won't see further expenditure after it, but in other words, the government did not want to lock in um, continuous higher expenditure without having mechanisms to start to unwind it. The challenge politically of unwinding it, though, is obviously, obviously pretty important. Um, but apart from spending, in recessions, we've seen different types of outcomes. Um, sometimes government has spent and become an owner of a business or an asset. Um, in some cases, uh, it's changed regulations or um, shaped outcomes from a as almost say from an industry consolidation perspective has been a reformer in that sense. The thing I've noticed this, this recession is um, I think the issue of, and I'll put it in inverted commas, smart regulation. 
the government governments, and I'll put state and federal in this bucket, have been very um, proactive in talking about and actually acting to reform regulation. Um, we've seen changes in uh, industrial relations laws, we've seen changes in planning laws, uh, we've seen changes in the, in the medical space. Things that were only ever once able to be done by a doctor in a surgery now are able to be done over the phone or able to be done somewhere else by a differently skilled person more appropriate skills to the particular task. So government has taken the opportunity um, with the banner of unlocking economic growth or taking the handbrake off economic growth, of rethinking regulation in many contexts. And some of that is certainly because we've had a digital option now, um, but we've had these options for years, but nothing has provided that burning platform for change. So I, I feel that the regulation space is one where government is going to have greater involvement, but it might actually be a change mechanism rather than more regulation per se. Um, debt and capital is, um, uh, and I'll show you a chart in a moment, debt and capital, we, we, government is spending a lot, um, and I'll show you the chart to, to explain that. Um, and what we're going to see is that we're going to have higher debt levels uh, ongoing. Now, maybe that's not a problem. And in fact, I'd suggest it isn't a problem. We shouldn't be too worried about debt in the current environment, just because the interest rates are so low. And that's what marks this as a very different environment. Um, think back, if, if you're old enough, think back to the 19, early 1990s recessions, where interest rates were in the teens. Um, so you had a problem of a downturn, debt accumulated in that time takes a long time to pay back. Um, if you want to pay it back, but the costs of not paying it back are equally significant from a servicing perspective. Let me show you um, two charts in this space. Um, this is the expenditure on um, fis temporary fiscal measures in response to COVID-19. I've made adjustments for the um, uh, JobKeeper numbers in Brulio that happened. Um, the forecasts in the 2021 year, uh, we've scaled back on the same basis that these numbers are scaled back for this year for JobKeeper. Uh, interestingly, um, the Parliamentary Budget Office uh, throws in an extra $40 billion next year of things that haven't been spent yet um, and aren't allocated yet, but it just uh, thinks there's another $40 billion of spending. So this could be a much bigger number than $100 billion. Um, but this is published, announced spending items related to COVID-19. Even if JobKeeper comes off next year because we wind it back in September, um, there will be other things in more targeted, I suspect, to replace some of those. But with that spending, it changes the profile of the federal government budget. If you can see here, the vast majority of the spending is the federal government. The state numbers are not significant when you look at it compared to the federal government, but they're certainly significant when you look at the capacity of states to raise revenue, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, <coughs> we don't think that Commonwealth's going to get back to a budget surplus for 19 years unless something changes. And by something changes, I mean it finds a way to raise more revenue or it finds a way to spend less. And I might just explain this profile a little bit because you look at it and think it's, it's an odd profile. Uh, clearly, the 20 and 21 years are really the numbers from this chart here. Um, what we see, though, is we actually see um, tax cuts in the middle of this decade coming, which they, we, there was a lot of fighting about last year. Federal government legislated them. Well, we've built those in. So the budget actually um, will get, get worse effectively before it gets better and it will be paid back over time. What really holds it back in those first few years is corporate taxes are, um, take a long time to recover. We only really just recovered from the GFC from a corporate tax perspective because companies that incurred losses can carry them forward. Um, and so you never really build back up your, your tax base appropriately. And that's what effectively we're gonna see over the next decade here. We've got a structural weakening in our tax system. And that's why we think tax reform becomes an issue here. Um, and it becomes an issue from two perspectives. One is government just needs to find money. Um, state governments are in the same situation. Um, reliance on stamp duty when um, we see um, potentially house prices come down, but even if they don't come down much, the volume of activity has certainly come back down. Um, so there's just raising enough money is the first point. 
um, and doing it in a consistently predictable manner. The second one though is this issue of tax reform, if it actually is thinking about it from a growth perspective, um, would focus on taking away those taxes that are the most distortionary and that, that hold back or hinder economic growth. Uh, we see in the press, um, particularly in New South Wales, has been a champion of talking about we should be taking off stamp duty. That has obvious implications from a, a, a city's perspective. Um, stamp duty by taxing the taxing the activity itself, uh, the sale activity, uh, hinders efficient transactions. It maybe hinders people moving cities for jobs because of the costs of moving are so significant. It probably hinders the downsizing of houses. Um, uh, as well. Uh, and so we've probably got, again, an inefficient all allocation of the, the housing stock in cities because of that. Um, and so uh, that's a tax reform that the states seem to be doing something about. Publicly, they're talking about it. Um, it'll be interesting to see what, how that can play out. And that's a long-term change. None of, I can't envisage that we can actually change stamp duty um, in, a, in a quick way if we're going to tax land more. But effectively, we should be taxing land more. It's just the form of it that is um, going to be the real challenge here. So we've got nine forces. Um, I've drawn a deep breath. How we come out of this really is a combination of how these forces play out and how we lean into some or we lean out of some. We think that the society can broadly be kind of the options in front of us can broadly go into two groups. One is we can go for growth. Um, and that is one where we uh, embrace the things that we've done well during the current environment, the smarter regulation, we embrace tax reform, um, we embrace digital, and we, we really challenge ourselves to say, we're going to grow out of this. And effectively, that's what happened after World War II. Uh, we didn't try to pay down our debt. Uh, we made the debt less significant as a percentage of GDP because we grew our GDP and we focused on that. If I was, again, doing this a couple of weeks ago, it felt like we were in a good position with China. Um, uh, China was coming out of this before us. We have a significant trading relationship with China. We would be dragged along with it. Um, our other major trading partner being Japan, equally not as harmed. US is a problem, a drag on global growth. The, the issue out of China is going to be our big challenge for that, that growth scenario. There is another scenario that is, again, using these nine forces, you can actually play it out. Um, and it's a, it's a more conservative one that focuses on self, um, it focuses on self-reliance, maybe is the best phrase. Um, and that's one where, for example, if I go back, um, if I go back to particularly consumption behaviour, consumers are negative. Um, we restrict migration because we want to uh, uh, give Australians priority for jobs. We um, focus on domestic supply chains and consolidating industry and bringing industry back to Australia. We can do that, but it is going to be a significant cost. Um, and effectively, it's giving up on um, the 30 years we've had where we've said as a nation, being outwardly focused, um, taking down tariffs, and being less protectionist. It is a different form of protection, not from a tariff perspective, but really from a buying insurance because we maybe feel more concerned about the future. We can do that, but if we do that, we still need to probably prioritise some areas for economic growth. Um, it probably does still mean tax reform. It probably means, and maybe this is a no regrets policy, which is around skills training. A theme under all of this is we've accelerated digital consumption. Um, that has a different set of skills, particularly if we don't think about it from a migration, patching those skills shortages through migration. We as a nation are going to have to think about how we upskill our country to give the unemployed training that is not about the job that they lost, but the job that we want them to have. Um, and I think training becomes, to me, the, the big thing that we're going to have to think about from a country. From a city's perspective, um, Sydney's disproportionately harmed compared to the rest of New South Wales. Um, different in Queensland, where the regions are disproportionately harmed because of their reliance on tourism. Um, but here, strong services sector, Sydney as the, the tourism hub for New South Wales, 
um, it's going to be a challenging time. How cities respond is also going to be a challenge out of if more people really do work from home. We have a tool called um, City Pulse, uh, where we look at the livability under three metrics, live, work and play. We're just starting to play with data in that space to see uh, how our livability changes if we don't need to spend time travelling to work every day in the same way. How does that change um, with the way we think about the attractiveness of particular areas? Um, areas that have access to more facilities um, uh, will shape the way that we think about our willingness not to travel somewhere else, but actually consolidate and rebuild our life around our homes. So I'll leave you there. Um, I will suggest it'll make more sense if you actually have a look at the report itself, um, but I'd love to have questions now. Okay, Jeremy, thank you very much. Um, and you have laid out a lot of material for us to think about. So everybody feel free to uh, type your question via the Q&A app. Um, Jeremy, let me start with a just very broad, naive question. Having laid all of this out, um, if you were prime minister <laughs> and you were, or, you, or, or, or let's, let's say if you were the principal economic advisor to the prime minister, what would you think are the most significant um, policy steps at the federal level that should be undertaken to, um, to enable the most successful recovery possible? So I, th I think there's two. One is a short and medium term and one is the longer term. The longer term is tax reform. Um, and it's not very sexy and people are, keep hearing about it. Um, it sounds dull, um, but we have, an, we, we have a non-competitive tax system um, and it does retard growth and we need to think about how that that's going to work. It is not though we need to fix it next week. This is, we should be thinking about changing the GST, for example, but that's a two years away exercise, but you need to be planning for it today. I think the number one thing we need to think about beyond the immediate um, is actually training. We're gonna have higher unemployment. Um, it may not be as bad as unemployment as we saw in the last recession. In fact, the last two recessions took between eight to 10 years each to get back to the level of unemployment that we had going into those recessions. So it's a 10-year a recovery, historically. Now, the Reserve Bank is not predicting that to be the case this time. If, if you look at, extrapolate some little lines, they're thinking it's a four to five year time frame. But that's unacceptable as well. We know that unemployment um, is, uh, costs government more from a welfare perspective. If you're unemployed, you're more likely to be unemployed for some time. The people who are most affected here are um, the young, uh, under the age of 20, they've got the least skills. Here it might be interesting, they might actually have more digital skills than some others though, um, and the older, because they've got, again, inappropriate skill set. Initially, women were particularly harmed as we shut down industries. The industries we shut down first, they were disproportionately in, um, hospitality, food service, arts and recreation. Um, interestingly, we've bounced back a little bit, and it's a, we've levelled out the unemployment a bit, but women have been more likely to drop out of the workforce, probably because they're looking after people at home, uh, their children at home. But most of the stimulus packages we're talking about at the moment going forward are actually ones that favour male dominated industries. So women were unemployed first, and they're probably gonna be employed last. I'm not saying that the level of unemployment is particularly different, but the timing means women are gonna be unemployed for longer. So we need to think about that as well. But our skills training system, um, I don't know who's on the call exactly, but I wouldn't say there's many people in this country that would argue our VET system is fantastic. Um, we know that apprentices got a ton got laid off, so that our apprenticeship model's probably destroyed in the short term as well. So we're going to have, um, particularly in vocational and skill, traditional skills problems, and are we training people for the new digital skills that we're actually going to need? Skills, to me, should be the thing that we as... Um, we should be demanding as the population that our governments focus on. Yeah, yeah. Whenever an economy goes through a significant structural change, um, this the the economy in aggregate may be fine, but there are um, individuals who may not make the transition unless they're supported to make that. And um, yeah, there, there's just 
a lot of human costs that doesn't have to be there if the skills support can be right. And uh, again, think of it from a spatial city perspective. Have we got facilities in the right places teaching the right things? We might have, um, but I suspect history says that we don't have. Yeah. Well, we did an event yesterday with um, three leaders of the university sector, a chancellor and two VCs. Um, they would have been and, a cheery bunch. Yeah, yeah. well, it actually was because, um, because they believe that that is a sector, that is an export sector poised for growth over the next decade if Australia plays its cards right. Um, but they also believe that the experiments with um, new forms of learning that have happened under COVID have accelerated things that they that they wanted to do for a long time, and a lot of those changes are going to spill over to vocational training as well. And that's that digital force. You know, we've been talking. These are things that we've been talking about for you know ten years, and suddenly it's we've got ten years in two months of growth. Yeah, yeah exactly. All right, let me shift gears and. Um, you need to uh, harass people to ask questions, I think, firstly. Yeah, yeah. No, I did. And again, everybody, uh, f f ask your questions. I will sort through them, and I'm doing that now. Um, the um, uh, Picking up on your comments about the, the um, possibility of more distributed remote working, um, this is one of the questions that urbanists are really sorting through all over the world, um, ranging, you know, a whole range of opinion. Um, a lot of concern about what it means for um, CBDs and downtowns. Um, uh, a lot of hope in uh, smaller cities that there may be somewhat of an economic renaissance. Mm -hmm. um, um, a new impetus for things like uh, fast rail connecting Sydney to Newcastle, similar similar ideas around London, um, all over the world, um, are, are thinking about that. Um, but I want to ask you about the implications of that from an economics perspective. Um, yeah. Were we wrong that uh, maximizing agglomeration is important for maximizing productivity and, and innovation? Did we exaggerate how important that was? Because if we were not wrong, then logically it follows that a more distributed form of working is going to lead to lower productivity. So this is the trillion dollar question, I think. It is hard to argue that CBD, I'll use CBDs as the, 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 where we've focused our agglomeration thinking around. But the benefits of agglomeration, I think were really clear. Um, and we've seen greater attraction and greater absorption into smaller areas of economic activity. But maybe that was within the paradigm of the technology framework that we were thinking about at that time. Mm -hmm. And so if we've made a jump to a different technology enabled way of working that gives us greater um, uh, productivity in a different way, then that might challenge some of those some of those agglomeration benefits. I, and it's maybe one of those things that if we'd had a traditional linear process, um, you would never notice it and never feel it. And it's the boiling the frog, but the frog's still alive. You're not quite boiled the frog, it's just warmed up. Um, so I think there is a risk now, and I say risk in a positive and negative way at the same time. There is a risk that the technology is actually unlocked for some people that they can be just as productive in a way that they'd never really contemplated and never felt comfortable taking the risk to try it before. It's hard to believe, again, that there, are, there aren't significant agglomeration benefits of having lots of people in the same area working off each other. They need to be close to each other. They feed off each other intellectually. But as I started today with, you don't need to see big shifts here to challenge traditional business operating models or, you know, or traditional ways of thinking. So it might be that even if only 5% of people or 3% of people said, I don't need to live in Sydney, that might be a, a, a risk to the way that we've thought about our businesses from a commercial real estate perspective, from a transport planning perspective. It, it can change quite dramatically, even that marginal shift. I don't think we, we don't have the answer, but I think now it is a question that if you'd asked us six months ago, we would have kind of laughed at. 
All right. Um, a question about um, Australia's connections to the rest of the world and how that affects recovery. Um, given that um, given that some significant trading partners like the United States have essentially given up on managing the pandemic. Um, I'm not allowed to say that. Yeah, I am. Uh, and given that other major trading partners like China are um, uh, not happy with um, with some of the things that that people in Australia say about about geopolitical matters, you know, unrelated to the economy, um, how how does Australia navigate the the really tricky kind of global geopolitical um, forces as it tries to recover. Australia is an island, but economically, um, no island is an island. Um, so so how, what's the right way to think about that for Australia? And, I, and I'm not a, a geopolitical expert, so please, this is couched within my frame here. Um, Australia's, when it's done best in internationally, it's when it's been part of a multilateral movement. Um, and so sticking our head above the parapet, particularly at the moment, doesn't feel like the right answer. So finding coalitions um, to do whatever we need to do feels to me like a, a, a direction. Now, the challenge is we've moved away from multilateral international relations over the last 15 years or so. We've, um, we, we've managed to get some large multilateral free trade agreements up, but we've more often than not had bilateral relations. So I feel we, we might swing back a little bit more to the friends that you want to be friends with and what can you do together. Um, the challenge with particularly obviously with China is um, that there's a security issue and there's a trade issue and we've had this debate and we haven't really resolved it and we're, we're in a geopolitical position at the moment where we're um, both friends of the US and friends of China but not necessarily great in either in particular ways. Um, We've always thought that the US would be a bigger drag on the global economy coming out of this. Um, all the forecasts we, it went in would, would take longer to recover. Um, that is going to be a drag. I don't think we should lose sight of Korea and Japan as significant trading partners who we don't have problems with. The interesting bit also with China at the moment is it's having disputes with a whole lot of countries. So we um, have a lot of students from China, uh, so does the US, so does Britain, so does some elements of um, Europe. Uh, but obviously China's having spats with Britain over Hong Kong at the moment. It's having spats with the US over all kinds of things. Um, so we're not necessarily terribly disadvantaged in a relative sense. Um, and actually our management of COVID provides us an opportunity to play up the clean green. Now it's clean green safe Australia. Um, so we actually still have some natural advantages in, in various markets. Education, if we play it right, it, there's an opportunity to play that up in a different way. Um, at the end of the day, as long as China keeps buying our iron ore and our coal, um, we're, we're okay. Um, you know, it puts little barriers here and there, but it's still been buying them. Um, barley and beef are obviously significant, but they pale compared to those two other commodities. So we're not terrible, but we're not in a great position. Um, our Asian leader described China as often doing drive-by shootings. And you hope it's a drive-by shooting, not something worse. Um, so take um, uh, Canada with its barley, I think it was, when they arrested a Huawei executive who was the daughter of a senior um, bureaucrat. So these things happen. Um, and we just hope that it doesn't kind of progress further from here. All right. Well, that's a good segue to a, to a question about um, climate. Um, from the perspective of the world, what matters is um, not so much Australia's own internal energy mix as Australia's um, export mix, um, which means that sooner or later, the coal exports, specifically the thermal coal exports in, in the first instance, um, but eventually probably all the fossil fuel exports are going to decline um, and, and, and mostly go away. In a sense, Australia is one of the most climate exposed countries in the world 
economically. Um, although there's a lot of uncertainty about the timing of that. Where do you see hope um, as an economist for sectors that can eventually replace um, the carbon intensive export sectors for Australia? So um, let me, th there's a lot of things in what you just asked. The, the first one is we think that in fact, it's economically advantageous and we will have to move to be a renewable focused domestic cons um, producer. Um, the, ass the lives of the assets mean they have to be replaced. Um, you wouldn't replace them with what we've got. So we will move with, with gas as an interim to greater renewable energy um, with stored battery and stored hydropower as enablers in that process. Um, governments throughout the world and industry throughout the world are looking at the next set of power after that. And hydrogen is the one that every state government in Australia kind of thinks is a, at least yeah. a, a reasonable prospect, but that's not 10 years time. That's 10 to 20 years time. So we, we've got a transition phase there. I wouldn't be so quick to s dismiss our exports of coal um, and LNG. Um, I think we will keep doing that for some time. If we don't continue doing that, then the hole that we're in in the country at the moment economically becomes uh, a much bigger hole. Yes, it does. So, but we know that over time, either they run out or the rest of the world transitions as well. Um, so there is a glide path that, but rather than a steep cliff, I think we have to kind of plan for. Um, as I said, hydrogen is the one that I think most people are betting on. Um, uh, we, Australia already has massive solar enablement, um, but we see other technology solutions as well where there's a cable being built to Singapore, which sounds ridiculous when I first heard it and you think that can't be right, Let's just get the extension cable out. Um, but they're building it, um, uh, Mike Cannon Brooks is one of the funders. Um, yeah. And so they're going to pump solar power from Australia into to augment the Singaporean grid and to, to de-risk it. Apparently the technology improvement in long cables is quite amazing. So we're going to see the time in Australia where um, Sydney at night is being powered by solar generation in Perth or in Western Australia, connected by a giant cable. Um, and so there, there is a technology revolution coming and I feel we're just on the cusp of that. Now technology kind of gets bagged as a, uh, as that must be a, a, a dodge. I don't think it is a dodge. I think the next the next generation of renewables is going to be digitally and technologi technologically enabled. Yeah. Um, well, and I guess it doesn't, for Australia's own energy use, it, it all has to be replaced. For the export sector, it just needs to be high value jobs of some kind. It doesn't necessarily need to be in energy. No, um, but it's going to take a long time to get to that point. But yeah. then, then that again reinforces the what's our skills training? What, yeah, it does. What, what are we able to do that is going to be valuable? Um, a question um, about advanced manufacturing. One of the forces you mentioned um, alluded to changing in the supply chains. Certainly, a renewed awareness about vulnerability of of supply chains. Um, every country. Every expensive country in the world right now seems to believe that there will, it will be the beneficiary of manufacturing moving out of China to some degree, uh, a reshoring. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether that actually creates very many jobs because if, it, if it's highly automated advanced manufacturing, um, the location in which the thing is made might not come with a lot of jobs. So a big debate happening about okay. that. In your view, what what is the realistic hope for Australia in this scenario? And, and we also have to think that a lot of manufacturing has been moving out of China anyway, mm -hmm. um, but it's been the low value add. So Myanmar and Vietnam, for example, are seeing quite significant boosts yep. of where China is no longer price competitive. So this is not a stable game that we're playing here. This is one yep. where people are always rethinking it. You're quite right. We can't all be we can't all be winners out of it. And you know, each state in Australia thinks that they're going to be the winner out of that process. So that's not going to happen in that, that kind of way. I do think it is at the margins. And I think it is, at the end of the day, price is still going to be a very significant component. We need to price in the risk. And maybe we haven't done that adequately from a, um, a single country or a single supplier 
risk hasn't been adequately costed in. But I, I don't see us just picking up man, advanced manufacturing facilities out of China um, and moving them everywhere around the world. And it's for the same reason we talked about agglomeration before. Um, it's not that it's one particular company. It's often these areas are, it is many manufacturers all producing their individual widget and component. In close proximity enables that. Um, you can't easily necessarily pick up an individual component out of that and bring it to another country. And equally, you probably can't pick up all of those activities and bring them to another country. So I still think China from first, almost a first mover advantage is going to be the dominant bit. But at the margins, there will be some, some, um, some often trivially, trivial components that, that shift out. Um, it might be apocryphal, but I've been told, so I'd be keen to be challenged, um, that almost all nails used on construction sites come from China, that we were very close to not having enough nails in this country at one stage. Wow. Um, and so it's, it's often the little things that you just, that don't seem significant in building a house, but we, we were apparently, um, for at least for some people, on the verge of having to stop because they couldn't source nails at the peak of the China lockdown. Yeah. Um, that makes you wonder, surely we could build a nail semi-cost effectively. Right. Can we? But it also makes you realize that this, the notion of defining essential products is quite tricky. It's a, it, in the end, a lot of things are essential. Yes. Um, I might be paraphrasing someone who I can see is on the call. So if I'm getting it wrong, I apologize. But they were talking about a product to be launched and it was um, a perfume bottle and it had the cap on the top. You know, I'm not a great perfume aficionado, but you, 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 the seal that locks it in before you mm -hmm. officially put the plunger in. That came from China and that held up the process. The bottles, no. The plunger, no. The actual perfume, no. It's the little seal. So it's right. not... The supply chain may fail in the most innocuous point, but if it still fails, it fails. Right, right. And it's, it's, um, it's impossible to predict yeah. every. So you can't like manage that. out risk. And so that's why I still think people will have a better conception of risk and go, eyes will be wide open. I don't view this great nirvana of new activity flooding to Australia. And if it does, it's not likely to be the advanced manufacturing is what I'm suggesting. And we might actually be at risk of losing some advanced manufacturing back to the US or wherever else that the, the parent company may be if it views that global risk is a bigger issue. Hmm. All right, uh, Jeremy, thank you so much for taking time to share your thoughts with us. Um, as Australia emerges out of, um, out of lockdown, um, the question of economic recovery is, is foremost um, for, for all of us. Um, so you are gonna be in high demand yourself in the uh, time ahead. Um, so we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, everybody else, thank you for joining uh, today's edition of Committee for Sydney Live, and we'll see you at the next one.